Greetings and welcome to Bubble Hurling. I'm Bubble and you're fantastic. So today we're going to be talking about all of the multicolored and colorless cards, including lands, I, I have to say that legally, um, that are left in the set for Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. Amazing set, really excited for it. It's already out in Arena and it'll be coming out soon to paper. I'm going to go to a pre-release. Super hyped. So let's um, let's start the review without further ado. Yes, it rhymes. I'm a bard. Here you go. Perfect segue. Oh my goodness. Take notes out of my book. So for a green and a red. Yeah, um, legendary creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them. So if they would enter with, say, two, they enter with three now. If they would normally enter with zero, like many cards do, it has a plus one, it gets one. So, you know, it doesn't have to have them coming in already. All right, little clarification there. Next up, level two. You pay the same cost of green and red. Legendary spells you cast cost green and red less to cast. This effect reduces only the amount of colored mana you play. That last little bit is a clarification. So, worth noting here that you pay the green-red cost, and that's reduced in all the um, all of the legendary spells, so it's almost free for the first spell you cast. Like, you just... If you would regularly play something that costs green, red, and X, you just do this instead, and it reduces the cost. It's actually quite nice there. And for the last ability, or the last level, you pay five. Whenever you cast a legendary spell, exile the top two cards of your library, you may play them this turn. My friends... I will have you know that just as many bards are in D&D 5e, this card is a house and is a Yes, most bards are actually houses, believe it or not. No. Um, <laughs> this card is amazing and will um, probably fornicate with multiple things in its lifetime. But anywho. Uh, yeah, that second ability is fantastic and you may wonder how many legendary spells do you have? Well, um, I did a little bit of research in the form of Jim Davis made a video saying that this card is fantastic, saw some of the video thinking, and I agree with him. There are quite a few legendary gruel spells out there, uh, namely creatures, on Clothus enchantment creature some of the time, you know, stuff. Um, and they're also kind of cheap. I believe, what is it, Galia, the Endless Dance, costs green and red, so she literally becomes free. The downside to playing legendary things is, of course, copies cannot enter the battlefield without triggering the legend rule, so... Your hand can get a little clunky there, but with a good variety, then you can certainly come around that. And the reduction of just everything being two less is insane. Um, imagine playing one for Clothus. Clothus being a one drop that you can't play on turn one, but still a one drop. It's very, very nice. There's also a few other ones that I don't really come to mind right now, but goddamn, this is a strong spell. And that last ability where it just gives you so much staying power. Bard class is amazing. If you see, the only thing is in a limited format, how many legendaries you're gonna have. There are a good number in the set. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's certainly more legendaries, I believe, than your average set. We're not going to include War of the Spark. Oh my God, what did you do? But still, a certain um, a good number there. But you will want to have more, and you also have to be in these colors. Otherwise, this is gonna do nothing for you. But if you're in these colors, if you have a handful of legendaries. Um, oh yeah, and the ability only triggers on legendary creatures as well, the first part. Oof. That's a big oof right there. So yeah, this is almost certainly just constructed playable, because you don't want to pay two mana and only have like one or two creatures to trigger it. Yeah, okay. In limited, this is going to be like a one out of five, unless you have like, geez, at least eight or nine legendary creatures in these colors. And hopefully there's multiple ones somehow, like, ugh, and then you just cannot really get anything off this, maybe even a 0 out of 5 limited, but in standard 5 out of 5, call me tomorrow. So fighter class, because it's a bard, so fighter class, it costs red and white. Level 1, when fighter class enters the battlefield, search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle. Also, if there's any questions about like what the class cards are exactly, because this is a new card type, and also the dungeoning, the, the venturing mechanic with dungeons, and the roll of d20 thing, I'm going to be making one more video, and it's going to be an intro that kind of goes over in more detail the mechanics and the specifics for um, for this set and like the flavor of it and how it actually works. So I think that'll be cool, I'm really looking forward to it, um, and watch out for that one if you have any questions, or leave a comment down below. Or just ask me on one of my streams while I try to cover up the button that's kind of shining through. There we go. Done. All right. So first ability, Stoneforge Mystic. Okay, nice. You do that. You reveal any equipment from your library and put it into your hand. All right. Let's see. All right. So next, ugh, to get to level two, you pay three mana. Equip abilities, you activate, cost two less to activate. And there's quite a few that are fairly expensive, so that is a very real reduction. 
not bad there. That makes quite a few things free and other things just, you know, much easier to work with. Okay. And for five mana, whenever a creature you control attacks, up to one target creature blocks it this combat if able. So it forces things to get blocked and see a creature you control. You don't target a creature, which means that if you attack like three things, it's forcing your opponent to block each one if it can. If they can. Okay. That's interesting. So, hmm. This is a strange sort of aggressive deck. I think ideally what you want to do is just put this on a, like a single thing. Maybe you can give it, maybe you have a Vigilance thing that gains heck, like Death Touch. Of course there's a busted combo with like First Strike and Death Touch. And if you can put that through equipment onto a creature, and then start attacking, and with the last ability your opponent has to block it, and you still manage to kill pretty much anything, so there's a lot of value in that. If there's anything that can equip at instant speed, that's insane, and also we're not playing um, cranial plating, so you know don't bring that up. But what we really want to know is, will an equipment deck actually be worth a damn thing here? The first ability is nice, but it's not really worth doing much. I mean, sure, you can guarantee to have the Embercleave in your hand. Most of the time when you're playing against Red, you always assume they have Embercleave because they always have Embercleave. So literally two mana do nothing because it's already there. And Embercleave doesn't care about the equip cost, nor does Wall of the Skyclaves. Uh, hmm. So unfortunately, I've come down quite a bit on these things. In limited, I'm going to give this a 2 out of 5. It at least gets an equipment, and you can pay 3 to make the equip cost 2 less, so it's like investing 1 mana now to, you know, make it 2 less later on. That's okay. That last ability is kind of strange, but I feel like there is some value to it. And in standard, this is probably like a 0. I don't think you're going to see too many equip things. It's unfortunate, because I like the artwork, just the solid, like, you know, it looks kind of cool. And the detail in the armor is actually insane in the sword, like all the little... Little stuff there. I think it's really nicely done. Okay, monk class, Monka S. So for a green, for a white and a blue, for Azorius, the second spell you cast each turn costs one less to cast. Okay, pretty legit. If you're playing some sort of card draw, then you could probably have a few things to cast and almost certainly um, get the reduction there. I like it. Uh, for again, the white and the blue. When this class becomes level 2, return up to one target non-land permanent to his owner's hand. So, you bounce something for 2 mana. Pretty slow, not, not great, but let's see what that last one does. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library for as long as it remains exiled. It has, you may cast this card from exile as long as you have cast another spell this turn. Worth noting here that it's saying that the card has that ability to it. So, if this happens and then your opponent destroys your monk class or gets sacrificed to doom foretold or something what i'm playing doom foretold maybe you are then it still is able to be cast it's not lost forever which is pretty nice um yeah i think just for the first ability for the reduction in cost of things this is pretty legit and it's during let's see it's on each turn so it does only reduce the second spell so you know you play one spell fine the second one you cast is cheaper the third one is back to the normal cost so there's that, but I think playing two spells a turn is still pretty damn doable and pretty damn nice. Um, let's see. Yeah, for the first part, it's almost worth it. The second one's a little boring, but it helps you control the board a little bit. And then the third is just insane. It's almost like drawing two cards each turn. That's actually amazing. In limited, yeah, this card is kind of busted. Like, I'm going to go ahead and say, like, and standard is maybe not as strong because it takes a while and maybe the format's too fast. It only costs three to get to the top level too. Like, you need three lands and you can reliably go, okay, turn two, play this, turn three, level it up, turn four, level it up. Um, wow, 4.5 out of 5 in standard. I think this card is insane. And in limited, 5 out of 5. Oh my goodness. And let's see, it says you may cast the card from exile, so if you exile a land with the last ability, you cannot play it, because lands aren't cast, they're just played. There's a there's a little difference there, literally one word changes everything, but I don't think you're too upset if you exile a land. And hopefully you just draw a better card, whatever it is, I think you're happy with it, so. Wow. Damn monks. Them and they're punching rocks, oh my god, what the hell are they thinking? Anywho, <laughs> Rogue Class. I lost a game to this one, so, but um, I actually probably don't think it's that good. Let's go over it again. So, in Demir, for blue and black, 
Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, exile the top card of that player's library face down. You may look at it for as long as it remains exiled, and you can do that at instant speed. So you're just going to troll your opponent basically the whole time you play this, okay? Uh, look, you know, obviously get the card exiled. What do you got there? Okay. Can I see that again? Hmm. One more time. Hmm. Okay, okay. Gotcha. And my, you finally get this like the fourth level where you can actually play the card. And like, oh god, what's it, what's it gonna be? He was looking at it the whole time. He kept like analyzing it like it's super involved. Oh my god, is it my planeswalker? And they're reading all the lines. It's like, I play your land. Is it? Let's see. And it says you can play cards. So anyway, let me actually read the rest of the card before I just start making jokes. Um, level two, creatures you control have menace. Pretty simple. It's okay. It's not fantastic, but it's all right. Um, Certainly nothing wrong with it, but I don't really think it's worth three mana. For although I guess if it was only two mana, it might be <laughs> it might be too cheap. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I think that ability costs two point five mana. Weird, I know. All right, four mana. You may play cards exiled with rogue class, and you may spend mana as though it were any mana, as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. So yes, if you do exile a land with this thing, you can play it, and you can play mind games with your opponent, and it's pretty hilarious and the fact that it like you know the second ability actually helps you trigger the first ability more often and then once you have enough things exiled you can stop attacking if you have enough things and just go to level four uh in limited this card is stupid like 3.5 out of 5 maybe 4 i don't know i'm not entirely certain on this one but like it's pretty high up there if you got the cards for it and there's quite a few things in blue and in blue in particular that can have unblockable or have more evasion to them so menace is nice if like you have other things that don't have that or if you have flyers because oftentimes your opponent might only have one flyer and otherwise you're going to be tricking that first ability um yeah this card's good in standard i don't think it's as good because the value you get in limited is different than standard it's just not the same there um and your decks are much more specialized so Hey, look, I, you know, managed to exile my opponent's salt ultimatum. <laughs> Erwin's ultimatum, cool. If only I had, you know, uh, multi monocolored cards. Unfortunately, I'm playing all multicolored cards because of this damn thing. And then you win anyway. Um, because you're playing that and then this. That's weird. Why are you being a bard rogue? Because you multiclassed. Hey, they don't even overlap. Um, but yeah, loses a little bit, bit of value in standard. So I'll give it like a... 2 out of 5 there. Could see a sideboard slot. Could see some regular play. I mean, Menace isn't terrible, but it's not as impactful as I feel like it could be. Alright. You have a blue and a red. Is it? My favorite two colors! Woo! Okay. Oddly enough, when you go to three colors, I drop the red for um for black and white. Who knew? Uh, when Sorcerer class enters the battlefield, draw two cards, then discard two cards. So two mana, draw two, discard two. <clears throat> okay. Sticks around. It's not terrible. For another two, creatures you control have tap, add, blue, or red. Spend this mana only to cast instant or sorcery spells, or to gain a class level. So if it was just that first part, instant or sorcery spells, I'd say it's okay, it's nothing really too flashy. The fact that you can use it to gain a class level is just like that little extra bit that, you, that makes you know that Wizards cares, you know? It's like the chocolate on your pillow, and then it says, not exposed to peanuts, because we know you have a peanut allergy, it's like, peanut allergy safe. Oh, look at that. I don't personally have one. But it's just the thought that gives that, that that really the thought that shows. Anyway, so for five mana to get to level three, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that deals, no, whenever you cast one, comma that spell deals damage to each opponent equal to the number of instant or sorcery spells that you've cast this turn. If anyone's familiar with grape shot, um, this just basically turns everything into a little grape shot where you just go blink. And then a few more blink blink, and you just keep on going. Ding, ding. And it's a strange thing because you're gonna want to have creatures. So you can use them as like mana rocks to cast more instants of sorceries, but you want instants of sorceries because they're what trigger the last ability, not the creatures. So what kind of deck this is going exactly? Maybe oh God, I think it's like I feel like it slows down the is it prowess because that's such a like it's very refined and very quick and very efficient with what it does, and this is not incredibly efficient. Let's see. In limited, this card is okay but it really has no value with creatures and creatures are what dominate the limited formats so for that reason i gotta just give this like a two out of five honestly it might only be the first ability that you even get to maybe you do the second one then you could play a slightly more expensive sorcery or something and be able to remove something from the board 
a little like more efficiently, but I don't know that you will necessarily get there unless you have a whole bunch of card draw. Let's see, beyond that, in standard, I think this is unfortunately too slow for what it does. I believe that we have the Royal Scions, both the named Royal Scions Planeswalker, um, you know, combination thing, in Eldraine, and the new ones, the Will and... What's their last name? There's Will and Rowan, but... Uh, uh, Kenrith? No, Kenrith is the first name. But, like, there is son and daughter, though. Ah, I forget what their last names are. But, anywho... Um, we have the flip cards in Strixhaven, and they both kind of favor that sort of like long game draw cards, um, discard cards, buff some things, do some more damage. I feel like they do a better job of what this card is trying to accomplish, and they don't really see a whole lot of play, so unfortunately I don't think it's going to do much in standard. Um, 1.5 out of 5. I kind of want it to work out, I just don't think it will, but if it does, I will absolutely be playing it. Adult Gold Dragon. You know this card got a lot of flack. For multiple things. Not the fact that it costs 5, although somewhat the fact that it costs 5. Not the fact that it's a 2-3, not a 4-3. Even though, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really pair too well against um, Goldspan Dragon, but it's okay. It's the fact that it is a flying lifelink case dragon. And that's it. We slapped three keywords in a creature, gave it the most generic name you could. Oh, but it's just called by the Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, please, you could have given this any sort of name. Honestly, like, did you really have to go with the Don't Gold Dragon? I don't know if it's really that, like, memorable and iconic. Then it's like, yes, I got a Don't Gold Dragon! Maybe in Limited, because it's not bad at all in Limited. But, like, just name this something else. Here, we're going to come up with a name for it together, okay? Say a letter. Congratulations, you said a letter. That's the name now. Okay. <laughs> oh, you didn't say a letter yet? Hold on. Okay, so whatever letter you thought you said the first time, add this to it now. Congratulations, you just named it, but... What? That's four letters? I, I added these two for, for you. Don't worry. Uh, anyway. So, Flying Life Lincoln Haste. Now, outside of the silliness of the name is very self-explanatory, and the keywords are there, and that's it. Uh, it is okay. In Standard, I honestly think we have better options for dragons that are both cheaper and a little flashier and just do a little more. So, I'm going to give this a 1 out of 5. This could potentially see play in like the Dragons Matters deck because I don't know if we actually have enough dragons at the similar cost and and in these colors. I was going to say specifically and then I was like, eh, I can just say in these colors, so I went with that instead. Um, that are impactful, or at least they're kind of cheap. So as far as dragons go, this isn't too expensive. Um, so this might see some play in that area, but I don't know how often you'll even want to play this card. And in Limited, this card's much better, of course, because those are very <laughs> relevant abilities that can help you, if not get back to the board, at least the lifelink helps you sustain a few more turns. So, Limited, um, let's see, like a 3.5 out of 5, maybe even 4, if I'm undervaluing this thing. And in Standard, yeah, I said 1, I'm gonna go with 1. Um, Barrowin, because I thought it was Barrowdin, but there is no D there, and until you get to the last word. Uh, Barrowin of Clan Under. Under, sorry, I had to make sure I pronounced the second R. Uh, so for <laughs> for four mana, you get a 3-3 three, three legendary dwarf cleric. When Barrowin of Clan Under enters the battlefield, venture into the dungeon. Okay. Whenever Barrowin of Clan Under attacks, return up to one creature card with a mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield if you've completed a dungeon. So let me tell you, I forget exactly what the card is, but there's a spirit. Um... It's like a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three trample, I believe. And when it deals combat damage, you get to go to your graveyard and get a creature with a mana value equal to the damage, or less, I suppose, and you put it back on the battlefield. Cool. That, that sounds really nice. I think it's uh, one of the new cards from Strixhaven. It's Boros. Or I should say it's Lorehold, because, you know, that's actually where it came from. Um, and that card definitely gave me some pretty explosive plays here and there. And then it just stopped working. Um, it's not because I think it's it's not because the card changed somehow. It's because that my opponents got better, and it's like okay, it turns out playing a three mana three three trample with this ability doesn't really do a whole lot when your opponent's playing a three mana five five. Like well, I can't attack, so I guess this card is just a three mana three three, and that's as far as I got. Um, no, it does ETB venture, which is okay. Otherwise, it's four mana three three. Of course, you need a dedicated venture deck to make this work, and then there's actually some good value to it. It also triggers on the, the ability 
triggers on the attack and not having to deal combat damage um, to a creature or player doesn't have to be turned a little sideways so you get the value there guaranteed which is pretty nice in a venture deck and you can probably even get back a creature that has like venture on etb and the cloister gargoyle costs three and it's um two and a white so it's like you know it's definitely in the same colors if you wanted to so there's some combo there potential how easy to venture through a dungeon it's not too difficult but i don't think you'll be able to have it by the time this thing gets its first attack in so a little awkward there but in limited if you have enough venture things if you have like a map or 50 feet of rope or something to repeatedly venture to guarantee that you get to that last part then i would play this if you can't consistently say you're going to get through a dungeon then it's just bad and it would be like a 1.5 out of 5 but if you have enough effects for it then it's more so like a, uh like a 3.5 yeah that gains a bit more value there in standard we can build it like a rounded of course uh i would go more so with a 2.5 it's a little better than your average thing there i could definitely see this making the rounds and not being too upset brunor battle hammer <laughs> awkward pause in the middle in case he had a middle name but he doesn't okay four mana five three legendary dwarf uh dwarf warrior warrior each creature you control gets plus two plus zero for each equipment attached to it mm. you may pay zero rather than pay the equip cost of the first equip ability you activate this turn or you activate each turn isn't there the giant hammer somewhere that costs like eight to equip but like doesn't that exist maybe standard i don't know is it in the right sets am i thinking about a set that's not really in standard anymore who knows but here's another activator for it that first ability is actually fairly relevant because you equip a little thing to a creature suddenly it gets that bonus say you equip the plus two mace it costs like two or three to equip gives plus two plus two as is in the name plus two mace makes sense now it gives plus four plus two your flashy shield that comes in attached but just gives plus this gives two toughness now it gives plus two plus two add instant speed Equips automatically. Um, that's actually pretty damn high value. There are plenty of equipment cards in this um, in this set that you can draft if you got this guy, and even if you didn't, being able to just be like, I play a creature and it acquires this suit of armor um, is not um, a bad game plan. It's something that will get you a few wins for sure. So in limited, this card is actually quite good. Uh, Three point five, maybe even four to five. It's very strong. In standard, no. I like that it's a dwarf, can work with Magda, but um, still no. Still no. Don't do it. One out of five, because dwarf. D d d uh, um, a. Do. Drizzt Durden. Okay, so uh, Drizzt. Is it Do Urden? Do Urden? I don't exactly know. Probably should have watched the video when someone actually says the name. And those be like, Drzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
double strike. The standard for double strike now is you play Embercleave and it gets double strike. But unlimited, like, legit card. Absolutely legit card. Ah, oh, Farida. Thank you. I can... <laughs> Hey, hey, Frida, how do you do? Right, uh, Devil's Chosen. Uh, is it card as well? Oh, how much I adore, is it? So for four mana, you get a 3-3. Three, three. Legendary Tiefling Warlock. Dark One's Own Luck. So a few more words than I was expecting, but okay. Whenever you roll one or more dice, uh, Farida, Devil's Chosen, gains flying and menace until end of turn. If any of those results was 10 or higher, wouldn't it be were 10 or higher? Maybe not, I don't know, tenses. Um, if any of those were 10 or higher, draw a card. So, literally, 40, no, no, 55% of the time, you roll a d20, and you get to draw a card as a bonus, and this thing also gains Flying and Menace. Um, this is quite nice. If you're in blue, there are a lot of roll a d20s effects. Also in red, because, you know, they're embracing the randomness and the recklessness of red, and blue is just also sunk, uh, slightly random, not as reckless, a little more calculated, but still, there's plenty of random nonsense that occurs and experimental so yeah in limited this card's quite nice i expect this to pretty much always be a flying menace creature which will do a lot of damage and draw you a few cards yeah like 3.5 out of 5 goes up to 4 out of 5 it's already pretty good value goes up to 4 out of 5 if you have a lot of roll d20 effects otherwise it's still a good card and in standard, it unfortunately doesn't really do a whole lot. <laughs> it's not terribly good. Sure, you can use one of those. Um, you can make a deck around rolling d20s, and it'll be fun and kind of funny to play. And like, oh, rolling dice every turn. Look at that. It's exciting. And maybe you, you know, draw a card every now and then. But hey, okay. uh, let's see. Yeah, you just roll. Okay, I see. I was seeing if you could draw multiple cards each turn. You can. Well, for every card that tells you to roll a die, like, you know, because sometimes you have the advantage giving fairy or whatever where you roll two dice, but even though you're rolling two dice because you roll them at the same time for the same roll a d20 effect, you would only draw one card if even if you got two tens. But say you play two different roll a d20, like, enabling cards, then you have two chances to draw a card. Um, and you may draw two cards. Okay, cool. Uh, in standard, this is like a 1.5 out of 5. I don't think it'll see some play, but it's kind of, is it? So I'm going to rate it a little more highly. It's probably a zero, but I I believe. Okay. Gretchen Titchwillow. Wow. Hello, words. Okay. All right. Gretchen Twitch Streamer is a two mana zero four legendary halfling druid. You can pay four mana, draw a card. You may put a land from your hand into the battlefield. It's okay. It's fairly slow for um for limited... Even though you can do this at instant speed for four mana, at least it is draw a card as well, and it can block a handful of things, but you have to wait till turn four and then spend your entire four mana to do it. It's decent as a top deck though, when nothing else is happening. Okay, it can get you a few cards. Standard is useless, there's better things to do in limited. Ugh. Yeah, standard is that Quandrix card that instant speed, draw two, and you can put a land on the battlefield, like, and this is draw one. Because it has a body, I guess it only costs two. I don't know. Um, but let's see. Yeah, and limited. This is like a two point five out of five. It's pretty damn good. It's just, it's not bad at all. It's, it's above average, but it's not so much of a threat that your opponent necessarily has to kill it, or it also doesn't have enough power. So you might just have to chump block with it and throw it away. I know four is a lot of toughness. Don't get me wrong, but it's a pretty fast limited. Let me tell you. Best format. Hama Bashar, Ruin Seeker. Or three mana, one of which being white, the other of which being blue. You get a 2 3 human wizard. Ruin abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time. That's the one my friend was telling me about. Okay. I forgot this thing even existed. Um, so, dungeons. There we go. There's dungeons. I know I had them on here somewhere. <clears throat> so, what do we have here? Dungeons you own. So, of course, that doesn't buff your opponent because that'd be silly. Uh, let's see, you can scry one twice, which is almost like scry two, but it's not. Make a couple things. This is legit. Like, imagine just going down. We're going to ignore the Tomb of Annihilation, because if you're playing blue and white, you're probably not playing that sort of um, life gain, like, aggressive, like, burn deck almost. Um, you're probably playing more of a control thing. So, let's see. You venture, you can scry a couple times, gain some life, make a couple treasures is pretty damn strong. Twisted Caverns targeting two creatures that can't attack? Yeah. This is actually a legit effect. Like, don't even... 
you can't dismiss this at all. Uh, if you have, obviously it doesn't have venture on its own though, so you need more enablers. In standard, it's probably gonna be too slow, but honestly, like, I like it. I'm gonna give it a three out of five in standard. I think this effect is actually super legit and not to be underestimated. In limited, I will give it a similar three out of five. If you have enough venture and more so, more so things that can trigger venture multiple times, like the Dragon Knight that can attack and uh, trigger venture that way, the Angel that can do the same thing, the dungeon map, which I guess we'll get to, and the 50 feet of rope because we're going to get those uh, later in the set, later in the review, then yes, this card goes up to like a four. Uh, and that's damn good. All right, uh, Galen Reclusive Painter. For two mana of the Rakdos variety, you get a one, two legendary human of Bard. Oh, this is a bard. Lovely. He's a painter. Looks like he's painting a thing. Okay. Uh, when... This is my buddy. It looks like a demon. Yes, it speaks to me. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you make a treasure token. Alright, so two mana. Mix a treasure. Almost like one mana. Nice. Other creatures you control enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them for each mana from a treasure spent to cast them. So, obviously this wants to go in a treasure deck. If you're not playing... A deck that's focused around making treasures is this good enough if you play a two mana one two make a treasure and that's it and like potentially the next creature you play gets a little buff yeah i think that's still pretty damn good in limited that's not bad at all that would alone would be like a three out of five there and the fact that it has the other ability there with the you know continuing if you spend treasures it does make you upvalue things that make treasure so be on the lookout for those but they are Fairly plentiful. I mean, hell, you find a cursed idol. Not in your colors, but you find one, so you might as well, you know, put it in your museum, I guess. Um, so, let's see there. Mm, mm, yes, yeah, it's still going to be 3 out of 5 unlimited, just because it only has the 1-2 body. But it's still pretty nice. And in standard, hmm, get it out early, potentially buff all your dudes as they come out, but no, nah, not buff all your dudes, just buff a few dudes. 2 out of 5 in standard. It's still definitely playable, but I don't know in what decks it's exactly playable. I know CGB did something and he said it was crazy in the thumbnail, but I didn't watch it. I'm just going to go off of what I got on this one. Alright. Ah, Cridal of Baldur's Gate. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So for 2 mana, for Demir mana, you get a 1-3 half elf, uh, human elf rogue, which is a half elf rogue, let's be honest. Alright. Whenever Cridal of Baldur's Gate... I wonder if there's any specific way to pronounce it. Should it be like Cridal of Baldur's Gate? Deals combat damage to a player. That player loses one life and mills a card. Then you gain one life and scry one. Oh, they only say his name once in the card effect. Damn. I, was, I want to say it again. Oh, well. Can't do it. It's a uh, legal obligations. I cannot say it more than it already says it in the word. In the in the text. Whenever you attack, you may pay two. If you do, the target creature can't be blocked this turn. Um, it's important to note that it is not just this creature. You can pay two and make any creature unblockable this turn that you know you control of course i guess you can target your opponents it just makes no damn sense <laughs> but you can um and you don't yeah you don't have to target this one so let's see deals come kind of to a player lose a life middle card gain a life scoring one it's okay it's not great i don't think rogues will play this because it doesn't have flash and ultimately even though it does mill your opponent and effectively deal two damage the scry is okay, the life gain is largely irrelevant, and the other ability to make things unblockable is kind of boring. So, if not really too high on that one. In limited, it's okay, because you get an unblockable, and you can make your bigger creature unblockable. There is some nice value to that. I guess you can also make other things unblockable in standard too, but how many things are going to be there? Mm -hmm. Still not feeling it. 1 out of 5 in standard, and this will be a... 2.5 out of 5 unlimited. Uh, it specifically has to deal damage to get those other effects to go off, like the first ones. Might not happen too often. And 2 mana is a decent amount to invest, but when you do, then it's pretty nice. Of course, your opponents see it coming the entire time, but if they can't block it, what can they do? Alright, ah, here we go. Uh, Minsk. Beloved Ranger. For Naya. We're into 3 colors now. For a red, green, and white, you get a 3-3 three, three Human Ranger. Legendary. When Minsk, beloved ranger, enters the battlefield, create Boo! Oh, do I have Boo? Um, oh, okay. There is a picture for the token, but it says what it is anyway. A legendary 1-1 one, one red hamster creature token with trample and haste, and it is hilarious, and it's adorable, and I love it so much. 
All right, so you pay three mana. You get a 3-3 three, three, and a 1-1 one, one Trample Haster. What else do you do? You can pay X until end of turn. Target creature you control has base power toughness XX and becomes a giant in addition to its other types. Activate only as a sorcery. So the you know the, the flavor here, I guess, the, the whole gimmick behind the card is you play this for three. You get a three mana, three, three. Decent bot, nothing wrong with that. And the 1-1. One, one. Then later on, or even the same turn because that is Trample, you pay however much you want. You make the token into a, you know, like a 6-6 six, six or something. And it still has Trample and Haste. And you swing in, and it's kind of cool. And it only let let's see. Until end of the turn, it does that. So your opponent does have a window to kill it with lesser removal, I'll say. But uh, for a while, it is actually, like, big. It's pretty damn big. Uh, wow. The turn you do it is pretty large, and it's on a solid body of 3-3. Three, three. It's going to be tough to play this thing, especially on Curve, even in like, Standard, because the mana is very restrictive. But there's not really much of a punishment for playing it off Curve, because you can just put the extra mana into buffing the Boo token, provided you're not playing this like in a situation where, well, it's 5 mana, so I can make it a 2-2, two, two, but my opponent has a 3-3 a three, three on the board, so it's useless. Like, okay, fine. But at least it makes a creature, and you can target whatever thing, um, whatever you want afterwards. So I could see this in a deck where you run out like a bunch of little dudes. Uh, Naya, this could even go in just a Naya deck as it is already. You have basically your Gruul package with um, what Naya Adventures, I guess. Edgewall Innkeeper, Bonecrusher Giant, uh, Despair Sentinel, Magda, Embercleave, of course, maybe even the Great Henge. And you splash the white for things like Giant Killer, as well as uh, Showed it on the Scalds. And you can put this in there. You're making some mana, you have another creature on the board, I'm not hating it. In limited, this, because it's three colors, I'm gonna call this, uh, jeez. I'm gonna bring this down to just a two out of five, even though the abilities are quite nice. Good luck casting this then. Um, it's going to be difficult, oftentimes you will not be able to play it on turn three if it's in your opening hand. If you can, then congratulations, you are in a very good spot. And in standard, uh, I see a deck where I can see some play. Maybe it just has a one or two of, but some play, certainly. So I'll bring it up to a three out of five. I don't think it breaks the deck or, you know, gives it a huge power spike, but I think it fits in quite nicely. Orcus, Prince of Undeath. Oh, look at that. It's what it's a Rakdos wannabe. This is my Rakdos cosplay. I, I stitched it together using the uh, the bones of my enemies and the flesh of the undead. So um, that's not actually wind that's moving the cape. It's actually just the skin still somewhat animated. And, <laughs> and this beard is protruding only from my neck. Okay, so yes, I am one to talk. I, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, a, um, it's a parody, clearly. All right, it's an homage. Anywho. So for X, two, a black and a red, you have a 5-3 Flying Trample Demon. That's actually pretty cool, not gonna lie. When Orcus, Prince of Undeath, enters the battlefield, choose one. Either each other creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, and you lose X life, or return up to X target creature cards with total mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and they gain haste until end of turn. So this is interesting, because you kind of want to play this in a deck where you have bigger things, <laughs> because you can, you can kill your opponent's creatures and not really your own. Worth noting with the first ability, it's other creatures, so even if you make X3 or greater, it doesn't kill itself. That's nice. So if you play this with larger things, it can, you know, help to not kill your own creatures. If you play with smaller things, the second ability works pretty well. You can just play this in sort of a mid-range deck, but I believe that this is better off with something... You can fit this quite nicely in sort of a Recto Sacrifice. Imagine playing this... So you total mana, total mana value, yeah. So if you just have like X equals two save, you can get back to um, the scorpions, I forget they're called exactly, but scorpions where they die and your opponent takes two damage, like that's not a bad play at all. You can get back a couple of the, the one mana, the new like one mana zombies and they die, you can make a treasure or target thing gets minus one, minus one, that's something. There are quite a few cheap creatures that you can recur with this guy so it's not bad and with that in mind if you're playing this in the right deck namely sacrifice a lot of death triggers you might not even mind killing your entire board <laughs> or killing a decent portion of your board as long as it gets rid of your opponent's board too and then you have a flying trample you have a uh, worst case you have a four mana five three flying trample and that is still pretty damn effective so for that 
in limited. Well, this card is going to be a four out of five. This is a very strong thing that your opponent has to answer. And if they and it also can just come down later on in the game and destroy everything, which is like insane. And the value you get, the fact that it puts the creatures on the battlefield, it's like fantastic. And in standard, this is going to be maybe a three. I think this is going to be interesting to see whether your opponents play this or Immature and Predator, or maybe both, but it'll be an interesting spot. All right, uh, Shesra. Or Shesra. Look, I think this is quite nice. I don't know. Um, Death's Whisper. So for four mana, you get a one three. Well, okay. I am immediately turned off with this card. I'm sorry. You, you had me in the first half. Uh, what do you do? Let's see. Bewitching Whispers. When Shesra, Death's Whisper, enters the battlefield, target creature blocks this turn of Fable. Okay, and then Whispers of the Grave, at the beginning of your end step, you must lean over to your opponent and whisper in their ear saying, This is a wizard sponsor to ASMR. And just kind of go with that and see how long it takes for them to concede or just immediately exit the venue. Um, and then, if a creature died this turn, you may pay two life if you do draw a card. So let's see, that second ability is pretty legit. Let's see, but it is just at the beginning of your end step, so it's not during each turn. Um, it doesn't activate at all during your opponent's turn, it's just your end step, so another little obnoxious timing thing there. And on ETB, something has to block this turn? Ugh. No, no, I think this is just too much of a loss of tempo. Like, you want to play this, and have a creature die, so you can pay two life to get a card. I would rather not play this and have a card. I'm sorry, the artwork is fantastic, I like Warlocks in particular. Um, but... And even Golgari, I don't hate Golgari at all. Like I like what this card is trying to convey. And if it was on like a two four body or a three three body, we'd be in business. But unfortunately, your term, your contract has been terminated. No, uh, jeez, one out of five and limited, and zero out of five standard. Ugh, goddamn, you were almost there. Skeletal swarming is a five minute enchantment with a black and a green in the mana cost. Each skeleton you control has trample, attacks these combat of able, and gets plus X plus zero, where X is the number of other skeletons you control. At the beginning of your end step, create a tapped 1-1 one, one black skeleton creature or token. If a creature died this turn, create two of those tokens instead. Again, that last part triggers at the, end, at the beginning of your end step, not your opponent's. Watch out. It's This card is nice, but it's actually a lot slower than you think. Um, I played this in a draft thinking that this is going to be my win card, like my crazy great win con, I'm just going to play this and they have infinite value. Um, yeah, it will eventually end up infinite, you know, the series does not converge, however, um, <laughs> it takes a while to get there. So, uh, let's see here, and the first part is nice, but the fact that they have to attack each combat of able, um, means things are not that great. Also, the extra little bonus of a creature die to make two skeletons, it's not that great unless you're having non-skeleton creatures die and counting on the you know the plus x plus zero really mattering a lot more then literally you either make a skeleton or one of your skeletons dies and you make two skeletons so either way you net one skeleton i mean it's not there's nothing wrong with like having that as like you know a way to recoup your losses but at the same time it's super slow and not very good and your skeletons will often just do nothing so Unless you have some other way to sacrifice them and do more with them that is not like outside of combat, this card just kind of falls flat. I think I said already, Outlaw's Merriment costs less and does more. There's some other cards that do more stuff too. Uh, yeah, so standard, this is going to be a big ol' zero. Limited, this is only going to be a two. I can't dismiss the fact that it just spits out tokens every turn and that's pretty good, but the fact that it costs five to get going, yeah, not great. I wouldn't. This isn't a bomb. Uh, Targnar, the Darman Fargnar. Okay. Uh, the Demon Fang Knoll. Jeez. So for red and green, you get a legendary creature. Interesting. For some reason, I feel like there's something with red and green and legendary, and, and, and there's some synergy with this almost as if like there's like a tune playing in my head telling me if you have bard class this is free hmm i can't quite connect the dots though okay anyway that'll come to me later if you trigger pack tactics let's see attacking creatures get plus one plus zero until end of turn okay keep in mind this is not a two two body for two so right and for four mana you can double targnar's power and toughness until end of turn and this also has the passive that targnar is 
an honorary pirate. So you can say Targnar. Okay. So, <laughs> and then you can go play Sea of Thieves afterwards. So let's see. This is a very nice card. Honestly, there's nothing wrong with this. This is going to be like a... In standard, this is a card that absolutely goes into that whole Gruul bard class deck. If it's in Wonderfully, you're playing aggro, you're attacking with a bunch of creatures, it's buffing all of them. And if you have extra mana, sure, it goes from a 2-2, probably get back to Actics, go to a 3-3, pay the 4 mana, go to a 6-6. It's legitimate. It's certainly a way to close out a game, because if you can do that turn 4 and win, then you'll do it. Um, yeah, and you can just smack people in the face. There are people on either side of me right now listening to me for this whole 45 minutes, and I just double slap right there. Pokemon move out of nowhere. Um... Yeah, this card's nice. In standard, it's like a 3 out of 5, like maybe even 3.5 out of 5. It's up there. And in limited, this is going to be a 3. Um, How often can you trigger pack tactics? Fairly often. Not guaranteed to play this turn 2, but a lot easier to play this turn 2 than to play Minsk on turn 3. And that other ability, you can actually pay 8 mana and double his power twice. And you go from 2 to 4 to 8. If it was actually a pack tactic sort of thing, then you go from 3 to 6 to 12. If you have any uh, equipment on it, say you made it like a 4-4, four, four, it just goes 4-8-16. I, I like my powers of things, you, you know, I'm just, yeah, I like math. Okay. Tiamat! Tiamat! Tiamat in all its glory. For 2 and Wooburg, total of 7 mana, you get a 7-7 seven, seven legendary dragon god. With flying, of course. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, when Tiamat enters the battlefield, if you cast it, search your library for up to five dragon cards, not named Tiamat, you know, and that each have different names. <laughs> Reveal them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. So, it's nice. It's very, very flavorful. It makes sense they would put this in the D&D set. It's one of those things you kind of sort of had to do it. In limited, if you're running all the colors, Good luck. Yes, there are treasures to help you um, fill out your curve and be able to splash more colors, but I believe that the format currently really favors um, like one or two color decks. You want to play as few colors as possible, not just for consistency, but because there's a lot of double mana, double colored um, pips, or you know, just double colored things in the mana cost, where it costs like you know, black, black, and one, or green, green, and two, or something along those lines, and it makes it much more difficult to play more colors. So playing all five is kind of insane, but you know what? By all means, do it, live that dream, and just make your way to the top. Honestly, I wish you the best. Um, really, just make it happen. This is almost certainly more so a... I mean, okay, so for that... God. Tiamat out of five. I really can't, <laughs> can't rate this card so much. I mean, I guess you just take every dragon you see. Oh my goodness, if you get to do that, you can almost certainly cast the dragons, although a lot of them do have double of their color in their mana cost, so good luck with that. I think all of them do, actually. Um, but assuming you have Wooburg plus two other mana, and the two other mana isn't colorless from mana rocks, then you can cast them. So, damn, damn, this isn't a high-end card. Um, in limited, if you get to pull this off, like absolutely five out of five, you should win the game based on having a 7 mana, based on having a flying 7-7 seven, seven, and having added at least 2 cards, hopefully, to your hand from your deck. Maybe 3. Probably not all 5, but who knows? Who am I to judge? Don't let me hold you back. Um, but let's see there. More realistically... Oh, God. I don't think you ever take this pack 1, pick 1, unless you're already playing a handful of dragons, and you have a lot of treasure, and you just happen to see this. Um, no, pack one, pick one, no, not pack one. Um, they would be more like a pack three. Pick one, likely. I don't think anyone's going to pass this. It's weird. We're, I don't think anyone passes this card, but I also don't think many people really want this card from a gameplay point of view. From a collection point of view, I'd probably take it anyway. <laughs> um, just be careful with this card is all I'm going to say, and follow your heart. The heart of the cards is with this one. In standard, I don't think it's going to do too much, because it's fairly expensive. And although... Uh, what's his name again? Uh, not not Bolas, the other one. Oh my god, niv it my favorite card. But not the one. Uh, niv it like the new guild pack, the Awakened guild pack, whatever, the, the rainbow one, the Wooburg one. 
although that didn't really see too much play in standard when it existed, it does see play in older formats as a pretty um, imposing deck, I believe. So that could be the same thing that happens here. It could be a similar thing. Where in standard just doesn't have the sheer quantity of support that it needs to get there. But in older formats where there's more cards, um, it might be okay. All right. Uh, Trellisara, Moon Dancer. For green and a white, you get a 2-2 Elf Cleric. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one plus one counter on Trellis Dancer and scry one. So this is a Johnny's Pride Knight, but you scry one, and it does actually cost two mana. And Elf is a relevant creature type. This is pretty legit. Like, Pride Knight on its own was already fairly playable in many decks. Um, it wasn't too far down. It was like just on the cusp of being like legit competitive tier one. It was like dedicated Pride Knight decks where they existed was like a tier 1.5 deck and i think that scry one actually does push it over the edge and bring it up to that like potentially tier one downside is that is legendary so you can't have more than one on the board at the same time unless you like helm on the host it somehow which is an older card um though there may be other ways in standard you can do it um i'm not exactly sure but it's still very very nice and i guess the scry can help so you don't get multiple copies and just smooth out your turns and, you know, be a little more consistent with what you do. So, yeah. Legitimate card. Absolutely. Um, in Limited, I'll even go so far as to say like 3.5 out of 5. If you have any sort of life gain, then this is very nice. It goes to a 3-3 right away and just goes up from there. Value. In Standard, um, because I said, yeah, this could probably get up there, I will give it the whole, not the whole, I will give it most of the whole package, which is 4 out of 5 there. Triumphant Adventure, or Orzhov mana, a white and a black. You get a 1-1 one, one Human Knight, both of which are actually relevant creature types, but I don't think it's going to do too much here. With Death Touch, and as long as it's your turn, it has First Strike. First Strike and Death Touch is pretty nice. You know, you go in, you attack, your opponent has to block with at least two things, and one other First Striker, Double Striker. Otherwise, you just kill it. Like, oh yeah, look at you. You're a big old Vorinclex, -like, aren't you? Boop. <laughs> Poke. Oh my god, very strong poke. What, he poked into death? I can't believe it. Whenever Triumphant Adventurer attacks, venture into the dungeon. So this is a semi-reliable venture where your opponent either lets you venture or they lose a creature or they have some sort of removal. So yeah, this is almost a guaranteed like venturing at least once, maybe twice. Sure, it can get bone crushed, but like at least a one for one there. If you don't get to attack. Um... I would say that, let me put these up there real quick, so venturing, I think scry 1 is like half a card, if there was a card that's like pay blue to scry 2, it wouldn't be terrible, like pay a single mana to scry 2, it'd be alright, it wouldn't be the end of the world, I think people would be like, yes, it exists, it's boring, but it's a legitimate card, right? card that cost one to scry 1, everyone would be like, what the hell is this, this is garbage, why do you exist? Um, so, for that manner, no, I guess for that matter, in that, based on that logic, um, <clears throat> if you get two attacks out of that, then your opponent removes it, I would call that a two for one. And that's legit. Also, aside from all these creatures you've been looking at recently, well, that's not a creature, this is not legendary. So you can play more of these things and just keep attacking. Um, and it always had that touch, just not first strike when it's your opponent's turn. Uh, so it's nice. Yeah, honestly, like. 3.5 out of 5 and limited, not bad at all. Your opponent does have to answer this, otherwise you will just run away with the game. And in standard, 3 out of 5. It's going to probably be a staple in any sort of um, adventure decks, unless it doesn't run both black and white. Which, with this thing existing, plus Nadar, and maybe a Serac, I don't see why you wouldn't run this card. Volo Guide to Monsters. Is a 4 mana 3 2. Jeez, I still gotta go through the colorless cards in the lands. Wow. Okay. Hopefully, I can go through those pretty quickly, though. 4 mana 3 2. Whenever you cast a creature spell that doesn't share a creature type with a creature you control or a creature card in your graveyard, copy that spell. So, that's a pretty nice effect. People are gonna try to play this in, in standard. It's gonna be kind of funny, but we've already seen something similar to this in um, Evolution Project, I believe it was called. Uh, I believe that's what it was. I think there was some sort of project that was in Ravnica Allegiance where it costs three and a green it was part of the simic combine um guild where or guardian project that was the name there we go which had a very similar thing except instead of copying a spell you drew a card 
and that saw basically no play. It was not very good, aside from the limited format where you're going to have a decent variety of cards. You can't reliably have copies. So this is basically limited out of five. Limited card, definitely out of five. Um, and when you get to untap with this thing and it survives and you're good, this thing can run away with the game. Four out of five in limited. Absolutely. Um, zero out of five in standard. Get out of my life. Yeah, you can play a turn four and then play a five drop, and it's almost certainly going to be countered. I mean, almost certainly going to be copied. Uh, more in your graveyard. But then when you play it again, if you have a second one, it's not going to trigger it. Eh, you know what? I'll, I'll go standard. Because it makes a copy, it doesn't draw a card, which... And this has a body, whereas Guardian Project was an enchantment. I will say 1.5 out of 5. I will amend my review, which I don't often do. You're special, Bolo. You're special. Xanathar! Look at this thing. Oh my goodness. He's like a... <laughs> this thing looked like an absolute chonker. Like, uh, look at this guy. I kind of just want to squish him. And he's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I ate the last brownie. <laughs> so... <laughs> uh, what are you going to do about it? That's what I thought. So for six mana, you get a five, six. <laughs> I ate all of the pixels in this picture. <laughs> you can't see shit. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. Until end of turn, that player can't cast spells. In case you're wondering, a spell is anything that uses the stack, or anything that goes on the stack, so your opponent can play lands, and I guess use abilities, but yeah, they, they can't. No instant sorcery creature enchantment, no. Okay, you may look at the top card of their library anytime, you may play the top card of the library, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast spells this way. So let's see, it does say play, so you can play a land. Notably though, you can also just leave a land on top of your library if you see that, because wouldn't you just love your opponent to draw a land sometimes? And just like, you know it's not going to be a creature. You also know every single card they draw. Um, let's see. Is that true? Let's see, the beginning of upkeep choose until, until end of turn. Okay, so it's not absolutely every card if they have additional card draw, because this triggers at the start of your upkeep and it goes away at the end of your turn. So during your opponent's turn, you cannot look at the top card of their library. But if they don't have any additional card draw, then they draw the card you just saw in your turn, and they play stuff, and then you take a look again when the, you know, turn comes back to you. So, first off, in limited, this is a 5 out of 5. This is amazing. Don't even, like, I haven't seen this card yet in play at all, but I will glad, I'll be happy when I do. <laughs> you know, I welcome that moment, either on my side of the board or my opponent's, hopefully mine, I don't know. Let's roll a d20 for it. Here we go. And the result is, I'm not going to... Um, nine. So, uh, probably not. All right, my opponent might have me on that one. Anywho, um, yeah, super nice there. Now, as far as standard goes, uh, is this really playable in standard because the six mana five six does not do anything when it hits the board, but it demands removal because then you just suddenly start winning, and it has a pseudo like Teferi effect where during your turn your opponent can't do anything. Um. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I could even see this thrown into like reanimator decks just because if you get to lock down your opponent and they can't counter further things, you just win. I am going to go ahead and I'm going to say 4 out of 5 in standard. And 5 out of 5 limited. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with the limited rating with the standard rating. Ooh. Maybe. Maybe. All right, and we're on to the colorless. Okay, just hitting that one hour mark. Let's keep on going and going strong. All right, for one mana, you get an artifact. Uh, the Bag of Holding, yes. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. You can pay two and tap to draw and discard, or you can pay four and tap and sacrifice this thing, or turn all cards exiled with Bag of Holding to their owner's hand. Worth noting in limited, there's a decent amount of enchantment and artifact removal. There's both. I just meant to say artifact. Um... But it does only cost one, and the draw discard is fairly relevant. Just make sure you're not discarding things with the... Like, there's no promise that you're going to get the cards back. But if you do later on, then that's absolutely some pretty good value. Um, yeah, I would say, like, 3 out of 5 in limited. There's nothing wrong with this thing, especially if you have some sort of artifact searching or synergy there. And standard, this doesn't actually see any play. I think we're just going to play Maze Mind Tome forever until um, we all get sick of reading. And that's kind of where I am already, but I don't know. Alright, dungeon map, 3 mana, It's uh, you can tap to add colorless, or pay 3 and tap to venture into the dungeon, only as a sorcery. You know, at first I thought this was pretty damn slow, but guess what, you can just 
use this as a mana rock and you don't even really feel too bad in standard i don't know if you run this in a venture deck i think you just kind of rely on creatures and other things that happen to have venture on the side to get you there or even the venture land but i don't think you want to run the dungeon map i think you can just run mana ramp if you want to that isn't this thing in limited however this is going to be a three out of five like you get to ramp with it and you have an alt alternate thing to put some of your mana into which is a very reliable and very like this is one of those things where if you have that you need to complete a dungeon um to get this bonus effect cards this can help enable that and that's a very good value so yeah three out of five not quite 3.5 out of 5. Now I'm going to stick with 3 out of 5, but very nice card. Even if you don't have too much adventure, you can just run this if your mana curve is pretty high. I of Vecna. Oh boy. We got the Vecnas, boys. Okay, did I put the thing in here where it's like all of them? I put them all in order. Okay, all right, in here. I do have this other picture, so I'm just going to bring this up because it works pretty well. So, nope, not you. Uh, or is it you? Nope, nope. It's probably the one that's not showing yet. Bam! There we go. We're just going to leave it on top there. So, we're specifically addressing the Eye of Vecna, but the hand is also in here. Um, the book is gone. I went over that in the black review, but they are um, a set. And I don't know. They are um, a trifecta sort of thing. So we'll start with the Eye on its own. ETB, draw a card and lose two life, and you have to pay two to put it in there. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you may pay two if you do draw a card and you lose two life. I don't hate that ability at all. I think it's pretty good. It is worth noting in limited, because um, that's where I managed to get the card and put it into my deck and play it a few times. The first time we play it, sure. You're paying two mana, losing two life, you know. Afterwards, though, not only does that two life add up pretty damn quickly, um, and hopefully the card draw does too, but the two mana you invest into it is actually very, very relevant. And because you can't say you're lively playing, you know, a control deck in limited, like, good luck with that. Where you'll have all the extra mana kind of floating around and you do things at instant speed so you can just you know do this draw an extra card and pass um no in limited you want to play pretty much whatever creature you can on curve and just do your best so this ah <sighs> geez if you could just pay two and do this like once per turn and didn't have to be at the beginning of your upkeep then i would give it like a 3.5 out of 5 i'd say this card is actually really quite nice but because of what it does there i'm going to bring it down to a three almost a 2.5 i don't want to say 2.75 it makes me feel bad but and that first trigger is like okay <clears throat> but if you're behind when you play this like it's a dangerous game you're playing which i think is appropriate because of vecna right the hand of vecna is a three mana equipment at the beginning of your com on combat on your turn equipped creature or creature you control named vecna gets plus x plus x worth noting it's or is not both so you know only one creature gets the buff um where x is the number of cards in your hand and the equipped cost is you can either pay two mana which is pretty cheap or you can pay one life for each card in your hand which is kind of funny because the flavor absolute like smashing platinum win here is if you have no cards in your hand or you have no hand it is free to equip the hand okay so <laughs> and back to reality uh let's see that is still a fairly strong effect it does encourage you to not play cards which is kind of weird but if you're going later on to the game where you don't necessarily need to play that land congratulations your creature's a little buffed is there any chance you're going to get all three of these in a draft or a sealed thing of course there's a chance but the chances of mini school i don't think it's actually really worth it to consider putting all like rating them as a thing if you get all three then sure i'm gonna say it's not worth it but i'll do it anyway because what's worth it these days if you get all three of these cards in a sealed or in a limited format thing uh the hand is pretty good it's not terrible the eye is all right and the fact that it's optional means it's it's not too bad at least it replaces itself at minimum and the book is mm, iffy because it's another one of those oh sorry about that <laughs> it's another one of those at the beginning of your end step things so not too excited about that but worth noting that the eye feeds the book to make more things and then it makes a token to equip the hand to uh let's see if you get them all yeah i would give each one individually like a four to five i think you just play it and just try to live the dream in standard where you can play multiples and obviously you know you're going to play these damn things this is awkward because you want to play like control up to the point where you play the hand on a creature for some reason 
and then the book you want to lose life during your turn somehow you're doing that don't know how you're doing that is a super awkward deck oh god this is really strange i don't think you really play any of these outside of that deck maybe the hand gives you some play if you want to do some weird like mono blue draw a bunch of cards suddenly this creature's huge and attack for lethal um or just any sort of deck that can draw a bunch of cards so because of this and it's really awkward i would say all of them because you're not gonna the hand maybe like a two out of five there the other two would only see play in a vecna deck i'll say and that deck is probably gonna be tier two if that maybe like tier 2.5 tier three and so yeah i wouldn't really rate them all too highly as a full thing like 1.5 each but hand of on its own two out of five okay uh let's get this off the screen and let's go through talked about it talked about it let's talk about it 50 feet of rope never leave home without it for one mana you have an artifact where you can climb over target wall can't block this turn i mean it's it's you know you just tap it there's no mana invested in there but it's okay not as uh, much of a flavor one as this thing but all right okay you can tie up ah uh, now we're talking i'm not here to king shame for three mana you can tap this and target creature doesn't untap during controller's next untap step or if it doesn't want to you know if it's really into it and they can just stay tapped for a while you know just, who am i to judge or you can repel down for four mana and tapping this adventure into the dungeon activate only as a sorcery so because of the i guess added utility because of tie up essentially it does cost a little more to venture than the dungeon map Dungeon map's also a mana rock, so honestly, I feel like that should be reversed, but um, I guess this just isn't quite as good as the map, but it's still pretty nice. So in limited, uh, yeah, this is like a, I would say 3 out of 5, eh, 2.5 out of 5, I'm going to say 2.5, yeah, it's okay. In standard, this is more so a 1, it's much more expensive to venture, you can play it, but the whole tie-up effect doesn't really do too much, and target wall can block is absolutely useless. At least your opponent might have, like, as a 40, as a 40, as a 39th or 40th card, put a wall in their deck, and it might be relevant, but, no. Oh, so, yeah, and standard 0 out of 5, yeah, okay. Great Axe, a 1-mana equipment, and you can equip for 5. There's that one thing that I read recently that i forgot of uh, the brunor like battle hammer or battle axe whatever dude that makes your equip things cheaper so it could be like a one mana equip for three plus four plus zero hey i think the irony here is that he's killing a dragon where you probably want to put this on one of your dragons or anything with wings limited this is okay like two out of five it's not insane like whatever creature you put this on it's probably gonna die and the equip cost it's expensive as hell, but you get it onto a creature, your opponent has to answer it, and you proceed to put this on other creatures and force your opponent to answer things. Um, and in standard, it's useless. Okay. Iron Golem. Just had to make sure I didn't skip something here. Four mana, five, three with vigilance, uh, attacks, or blocks each combat of able. Because it's a vigilance. So it probably dies, like, in a couple turns. Basically, you play this, your opponent is actually a three, three. It has to block, and that's that's that. That's the end of the story. So consider this four mana removal for little things. Unless you have artifact synergy, this is gonna be like a one out of five. And if you, or a, an absolute shit ton of removal. If you don't have either of those two things, then it's a one out of five. If you do, then I'll give it like a 3.5. Yeah, this is a solid body, five, three, keeps attacking. Like, what are you doing? Vigilance is nice. In standard, it's useless standard there are better things leather armor this is a funny one one mana to play it equipped creature gets plus one like, sorry plus zero plus one and has ward one then equipped for zero activate only once each turn this is kind of strange you can just kind of throw it into your equip deck and you just kind of throw it on things it's free i'm just <laughs> i'm just gonna do this just gonna do this i'm just going to no so for that reason it's kind of a throw-in card I will say 1.5 out of 5, not a 1, not a 0. In limited, it does have some odd value where you just put it down, the ward is obnoxious, the extra toughness actually matters sometimes, it's strange. The biggest thing is that there's artifact and equipment synergy, and this is the easiest way to enable that. Like certain things when they're equipped, they get a bonus thing, you can equip for 0 on the card, come on. In standard, 
No, but in limited, there is actually some way to make use of this. Mimic, uh, you know, the thing is, when this card is first revealed in like Mythic Spoiler, it was spelled um, M-I-M-I-K, and it was in a different language, but I didn't realize that right away, so I thought I'd just been spelling Mimic the wrong way like my whole life. Like, oh my god, there's a K at the end? What have I been doing? I've been looking at this C, I've been using Cs, I was wrong! How could I have been so blind? Especially when the Mimic has like, um, eight eyes? Nope, there's more than that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe eleven or twelve on this side? Anyway, two mana. You can, and this is an artifact treasure by the way, with the treasure thing you can sacrifice it at one mana of any color. Or you can pay two, and it becomes a shapeshifter artifact creature with base power and toughness 3-3 three, three, till end of turn. Interesting, fun little card. Um, not really any reason to play this. I really don't want to pay two mana to then get one mana, because that's really how I see this. I don't think this is going to be a creature very often. I think it's more often going to be sacrificed to help um, mana fix and, you know, give you a little bit of ram for the turn. So because of that... 1 out of 5 in limited and 0 out of 5 in standard. Spare dagger. Okay, so for 1 mana you get a cheap little thing there. Equip creature gets plus 1 plus 0 and has whenever this creature attacks you may sacrifice it when sacrifice the dagger. When you do, deal 1 damage to any target and equip for 1. Uh, pretty decent actually, pretty cheap. There's a reasonable number of X1s in the set where this can kill them and this is only on attack declaration doesn't have to deal combat damage doesn't have to be blocked or something so you turn it sideways you deal one damage to something and you kill a weak creature on the other side of that you have to deal the damage before you know blockers are declared so if you're trying to get around your opponent's x2 with your or you're trying to deal two damage to your opponent's creature hoping they block maybe they don't play along who knows so there is the other side of that you know ideal scenario but it's still not too bad again it's very very uh small and not <laughs> very very small and pathetic if you're into that but it's a cheap thing you might throw it in as like your you know last card or so if again if you have the synergy if you don't have any synergy do not bother and with that um 1.5 out of 5 in limited and zero in standard. Spiked Pit Trap. This thing was surprisingly effective. Not sure why it has flash. I guess you can play it for six mana, but for one mana, um, you get a flash pit trap. You can pay five, tap it, and sacrifice it. Target creature. Sorry, hold on. I'm losing the ability to speak. Okay. Choose target creature, then roll a d20. If you get a one through nine, this deals five damage to that creature. If you get a 10 through 20, it still deals five damage. But then you make a treasure token because I guess the creature happened to have some money on the body at the time. I don't know. Just good timing. You know, you, you got them just after banking hours. Um, I mean, before. At what point would a creature have more money? Before or after the banks are open? Maybe during banking hours. Yeah, during banking hours. Maybe they're a banker, though. So it's after banking hours. But do the bankers take the money home with them? Do they earn a daily wage? These are the important questions. Anyway, this is actually pretty legitimate because five power... Or five damage is a lot to do to a creature, and it's pretty, um, pretty reliably gonna kill whatever. There's not too many things that have six toughness in the set, so this is even though your opponent can see it coming, what are they supposed to do? Like just not play the big creature, especially if they're behind on board. There's no way to really get around it, and it's only a one mana investment to put your opponent in that weird spot. This card is actually legit. I would say three out of five in limited. Don't even like doubt me. And you do have the option of flashing it in if you have say six mana and just flash it, pay 5, tap it, and immediately do the 5 damage. And if you can happen to get a treasure token, then it actually, like, pays for itself somewhat. I know you still have to pay the 5, but it's just added value. Yeah. And standard, no, there's other removal, unless you're just trying to throw this into, like, a blue deck to deal damage for some reason. That'd be weird. Oh lord, it's the deck of many things. Yep, you saw it coming, folks. You knew it was coming. Here it is. It made its way here. God damn. All right. For five mana, I'm so happy they printed this card. It's insane. You get a legendary artifact. That's all right. There is only one deck of many things at a time. You can pay two and tap this to <laughs> roll the dice. Roll a d20 and subtract the number of cards in your hand. If the result is zero or less, discard your hand. Oh, how sad. If you get a 1 through 9, so you can only roll a net 20 if you have 0 cards in your hand, essentially. Because even if you get a 20, you subtract whatever. So you want to play this with 
less cards in your hand in order to roll higher numbers or to get higher results. Okay. The 1 through 9 result gets you to return a card at random from your graveyard to your hand. Not, not bad. Nothing wrong with that. If you get a 10 through a 19, you draw two cards. For two mana, that's that's good. Keeping in mind this costs five to play, but still, that's good. And if you get that nat 20 with zero cards in your hand somehow, and you just you just rip it off the top or whatever, and you throw it down, you pay seven mana and go for it, put a creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. When that creature dies, its owner loses the game. There's a lot of nuance to this thing. There's a lot of details to this that made me read this like three or four times to actually understand it. And let me see if I can convey that understanding to you. So, the first two abilities make sense. The whole not have any cards in your hand makes sense. You know, whatever. All right. That nat 20. Put a creature in, put a creature card from any graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. Understandable. Reanimator. You can target out of the side. That's really nice. Okay. So we know that there's going to be a creature onto the battlefield. When that creature dies, its owner loses the game. So the first time I read this, I was like, when the creature dies, you lose the game. Well, that kind of sucks. That's a really big all or nothing sort of thing. Like, I hope you can't kill this, otherwise I'm dead. Its owner, as you might imagine, is not necessarily its controller. So if you target your own creature, say you have some big creatures in the graveyard, notably they don't have haste, um, and you reanimate it. If your opponent kills it, you lose the game. That's unfortunate. Better luck next time. If you choose your opponent's creature, it's still on your side of the board. If your opponent kills it, or if you kill it, if something kills it, your opponent loses the game. In particular, it's that opponent. So if you're playing a multiplayer game where it's like, you know, four or five people, then, you know, sure you have more options, but you got to keep track of who's who's and, you know, details. So let's say you play this in a good scenario where your opponent had a bomb creature, you killed it or you milled it somehow, and now you have it. Your opponent is in the strange spot where, well, I can either let this creature attack and probably eventually kill me, or I have to find some way to dis like to neutralize it on the board without killing it, because if I kill it, then I just die. Meanwhile, hopefully you're attacking every turn within chipping away or doing something. Um, yeah, that's pretty damn legit. If it happens to have like a self-sacrifice ability, then congratulations, you win the game. That's like awesome. In the unfortunate case where, say, your opponent has no creatures, and you still have this in your deck, or, or nothing in the graveyard at least, and you play it, you say, well, at least I'm probably going to get a card back from my graveyard. What are the chances I get a 20? Um, and you can control it a little bit, but it's having a card in your hand. You can't get that 20 ability, but say you don't. If you happen to get the 20 while you have a creature in your graveyard, and your opponent has none, it is not optional, you have to reanimate that creature, and then if it dies, you lose. So be very wary of that very, very narrow, like 1%, like 5% of the time, you get the 20. And I would say maybe one out of every 20 games, so another 5%, you, uh, geez, run into the case where only you have a creature. And that's not even accounting for, like, well, maybe you're running a deck with no creatures, maybe your opponent's doing that, maybe this is in the sideboard, you know? I'm just throwing out numbers there. The first, and like, you know, also you can control the number of cards in your hand to some degree. So, just something to note, okay? But more often than not, you animate your opponent's creature, and you hit him with, you know, I'm either going to beat you to death with this, or you're going to kill yourself somehow. It's neat. Play this in deck with black, so you can try to kill the creature yourself. Pretty legit. Uh, I love this card. I think this card's fantastic. Uh, more often than not, you'll probably get the 10 through 19, even if you have a few cards in your hand. And just being able to pay two and tap this to draw two cards, fantastic. For that reason, uh, yeah, in limited, this will be like a 4 out of 5. I don't think it's 5 out of 5. Maybe it should be. Just keep putting cards in your hand. Yeah, hell yeah, you know what, why not? Although, if you get 0 or less, it feels pretty bad. You actually have a chance to discard your entire hand, that's the dangerous thing. And the more cards you have in your hand, the more likely you are to lose them. Damn, like say you have like five cards in hand. If you draw, if you roll a five or less, it's just gone. Shit. Still four to five. Just because, you know what? You're not here to... <laughs> you didn't play this game not to give it a shot. And in standard, uh, holy shit. Um, oh, it's going to be so much fun. And it's going to be one of those like things to check off on your <laughs> on your D&D bingo. Um, got the 20 on deck of many things. Yeah. So, for that reason, 
I will say three out of five in standard. I don't think it's gonna be super crazy explosive. There are some variables you have to account for, um, but goddamn, it just seems like so much fun. Oh my God. The fun level is off the charge. Starts like 10, 10 out of 10, 18 out of 15, d d mercy out of Squirtle, like just amazing card. Okay, I'm gonna put those back and just kind of kill some time there. Treasure chest is a three mana artifact. You can pay four and sacrifice it. Worth noting, you have to actually sacrifice the damn thing to roll a d20. So you get one shot at this. And if you roll a one, you lose three life. <laughs> this is one of the few cards that actually has a crit fail um, punishment. Most of them say one through nine. You know, something happens. Um, but this is just, you roll a one, you really messed up. <laughs> uh, if you get a two through a nine, you get five treasure tokens. And if you get a ten through nineteen, you gain three life and draw three cards. If you get that nat twenty... You search your library for a card. If it's an artifact card, you can put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put that card into your hand, then shuffle. So, kind of a cold out the Forge Master, but much less likely to occur <laughs> with an extra spice of RNG there to really um, make it feel that much better when you get it. But in limited, this card is... <gasps> Drum roll, please. I don't want to potentially blow out your eardrums. I don't know how loud this is, but hopefully it's not too loud. If you can't hear it at all, then I am tapping on the desk. There you go. Now you know. English description is available. Um, this card's a 0 out of 5 limited. I'm sorry, but if you invest 7 mana to eventually lose 3 life, you lose the game. And I don't want to lose 1 out of 20 games when I play this card because I rolled a 1, which is actually going to be like 1 out of 5 games because, yeah, I'm, I've rolled a 1 or 2 in my day. No, I don't think I've rolled a nat 1 in like, maybe I've rolled like one nat 1 on Arena so far, but IRL, yeah. Um, sure, odds are you either, you know, draw some cards and gain life or make treasure tokens. That's nice, but I don't think you can live in that fringe possibility where you get absolutely destroyed by your own card. And if you get the 20, it might not even be all that worth it. Do you have a huge artifact that will be a good payoff for rolling the 20? Maybe not. Yeah, actual 0 out of 5 limited. And constructed, I'll give it a 1. I don't know what huge artifact you can play. <laughs> Meteor Golem, I don't even think this is standard anymore. Um, I think you can play the Henge, I guess, but the Henge is already cheap enough if you're playing it in the right deck. So this is interesting. I like the idea behind it, but I don't actually like it at all. Onward to the land! Okay, this should be mean, meaning that we are almost done. So, here we go. There is a cycle of what is known as, well actually, it's a combination of, pardon me, fast lands, where it's the first line, if you control two or more other lands, that enters tapped. Um, worth noting that this is actually, actually has to be even faster than the previous fast lands, where I'd say if you control, um, like, I guess three or more other lands interest tapped. I don't know. They, they brought the number down by one for these. Um, of course, they tap for whatever color. They are not basic, so you can't really search them very easily. And each of them has the ability to become a creature. So they are s very speedy man lands. I'm going to call them bolt lands. No, bolt lands are the ones where you can pay three life. I'm going to call these Usain lands. Okay, cool. So, Cave of the Frost Dragon is the white Usain land. And for... I'm not even kidding. So, for... <laughs> For 5 mana, you can have it become a 3-4 white dragon creature with flying until another turn is still a land. That is absolutely a 4 to 5 in limited, and in standard, I don't see why most of these won't see play. Like, honestly, these are super nice, and I love them a lot. And the 3-4 that you can just, you know, have come out of nowhere, it can be a blocker, you can do it during your opponent's turn, it can just be a regular creature on your turn and attack with. It's good. Nothing wrong with this. White is usually in some kind of control deck. Wipe the board, animate this thing, start swinging. Yes, you can also play Faceless Haven, and that swings for four instead of swinging for three. But this is just fun. Maybe there's a reason you're not playing Snowlands. Maybe Redain is everywhere. All right, yeah, lovely card. Next up is Den of the Bugbear. I thought I'd put these in Wooburg order. Guess not. Whatever. There's still going to be all the man lands. All the uh, Usain lands, rather. So, Den of the Bugbear, one of the first ones that was actually um, revealed, or spoiled, rather. Taps for red. You can pay four to let a turn. Den of the Bugbear becomes a 3-2 red goblin creature with whenever this creature attacks, create a 1-1 red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. It's still a land. 
really quite nice. It's a little slow for red, certainly. I don't know if you necessarily want to pay four mana for this, but it's not the worst, um, worst place to spend your mana. Honestly, it's not even that bad for the rate there. It's just unfortunate that you're not putting a you know creature on the board like that the three doesn't stay on the board. The Elysian War Boss, I believe, is basically the same sort of card that they are embodying with this. <laughs> embodying with a land? No? Yeah, maybe. We'll go with it. So Yeah, this card is also gonna give me the hiccups. God damn. I can do it. Power through. Um yeah, I'd say another 4 out of 5 both ways. I think this card's really nice. I see nothing wrong with any of these. All of the Storm Giants is the one that people think is actually extra spicy. It's the blue one. Uh, for 6 mana, it can become a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant creature with Ward 3, which is pretty damn legit. In limited, I'll say this is a 7... 7 out of 7. Sure, why not? <laughs> 5 out of 7 even. So... <laughs> Just because it makes a very large, sizable creature that comes with its own protection. I know, right? Like, is can you ask for more in a person, really? Just be wary. Um, be self-conscious and be prepared. Um, but honestly, this card's super nice and is... Yeah. I think this might be the best of the Usain lands, and therefore, yeah, 5 out of 5 in limited. And I will say 4.5 out of 5 in standard. It might see play in that sort of weird mono blue tempo aggressive deck that I want to make, so I will make, but worst case, it's still gonna be like an island that comes in tapped. I don't hate it. All right, Hive of the Eye Tyrant. I love how there's like the the image of a beholder kind of like almost like a shadow or something like a relief of it in the thing. I think it's really clever. So, the black card here is you can pay four, gel in a turn, it becomes a 3 3 black beholder creature with menace. And whenever this creature attacks, exile a target card. From defending player's graveyard, it's still a land. It's okay. It's probably the least impactful of all of them. The at least it does have the, you know, almost like it does. It is more difficult to block because of the menace, and it has the ability where it can exile things, which is nice. Cling to dust was the card I was trying to remember from before. It was cling to dust. I knew it. I don't know if that was a green card or one of these multicolored cards. I think it was multicolored, and I couldn't remember the damn thing, but it was cling to dust. So, <laughs> I knew it would come back to me. There we are. But, anywho, um, it's okay. It's not crazy. Um, this is the one I'm least excited for. But, it's still alright. In limited, I'm going to bring it down to a 3.5 out of 5. Your opponent can probably deal with a 3-3. Menace makes it obnoxious to deal with, but you can probably deal with it. it. Has to be instant speed, or just blocking with a creature. But, hey. Eh. In standard, I will make this, I'll bring it back up to four, because you're running black, you kind of have a decent amount of removal. Hell, you can even just go like Ugin, exile all the like the stuff in the next turn, plus Ugin to kill whatever and animate this thing, if you're playing like a mono black control. Yeah, absolutely, black has ways to make this work. Layer of the Hydra is the green one, and it's a spicy one as well. Um, of course, you know, Usain uh, qualities, and for, you can pay X and green. Until another turn, this becomes an XX green Hydra creature, and it's still a land, X can't be zero. So you can't pay just a single green and nothing for X and then destroy your land. That'd be weird. So I'm glad they just like kind of idiot-proofed this. There is probably some value to do th doing that if you have like the Crucible of Worlds or Ramanop Excavator or something, and then you have uh, one of those payoff cards or when you play a land, do this effect. Because then you could just play like, you know, I play this thing and I pay green. And, you know, don't have zero for X, this goes to the graveyard, sure. And just keep doing that over and over again. Let's see, though. Uh, in terms of where you're going to play this, like, legitimately, in uh, limited, 5 out of 5, and in standard, this is also just going to be 5 out of 5. Mono Green's already making some waves um, in standard with new decks and stuff and aggressive things. And this is by far a fantastic card to put in that deck. And in limited, this scales very well with anything. It's good at any point in the game, essentially. Um, yeah, fantastic card. Dungeon Descent, ah, oh, this is the land that can venture. Only if you have a legendary creature, though. So, enters tapped, feels bad. Tap for colors, feels okay. You pay four and tap this, and an untapped legendary creature control. Venture the dungeon, only at sorcery speed. So it's okay, it's really kind of clunky. But if you're not venturing, at least it taps for something, right? It's colorless, but it's something. And the artwork is kind of cool as well. I like it. 
There are a decent number of legendaries in the set already, so in limited, you can somewhat reliably have that ability go off. And even if you don't, it's not the end of the world if you just happen to play a land that comes and tap the turn. If you're playing one or two colors, if you're playing three, I would say this is unplayable. Or just not worth the risk of potentially cutting off one of your colors by like drawing the wrong land. And in standard, this is certainly an option. I would probably stick with the dungeon map because it also, like sure you have to invest three mana into it, but also taps for colorless. And you don't have to worry about having creatures and you can just tap it again for exploration. The benefit to this thing is that it's a land so it can come on in turn one. Um, or there's just no cast to play it, I guess. No cost to play it. So in limited, uh, let's see here. I'll give it like a 2 out of 5, maybe 2.5 out of 5. It's okay. I am never, like, first picking this. Not in a million years. Unless... No, oh, because if I have a bunch of venture payoff things, then I probably already have a good amount of venture. And this is not a very strong venture ability. This is probably the weakest aside, no, including the rope, of the repeated adventure abilities. So, yeah. In standard, let's see, so I gave this a 2 out of 5 in limited. I'll give it a 2.5 out of 5 in standard. I don't think it's going to see any play. I think there's better venture things, but I don't want to dismiss the fact that it's a land, so maybe that actually puts it above where I'm putting it. Um, Evolving Wilds reprint. Cool. All right. In limited, you can play it if you're playing, like, you know, more than two colors, I would say, then throw an Evolving Wilds in there, but whatever. You'll probably get past it at some point. Um, yeah, it, it's fine. We already have this card. No need to really look at it further. Temple of the Dragon Queen. Worth noting, even though it looks awesome, it is uncommon. I thought when I got this, I pulled a rare, and I was like, oh, okay, it's interesting, but kind of boring. No, it's actually uncommon, and I appreciate that. Because Wizards definitely could have made this a rare, um, and I'm glad they didn't. All right. As this enters the battlefield, you may reveal a dragon card from your hand. Temple of the Dragon Queen enters the battlefield tapped unless you reveal a dragon card this way or control a dragon. As it enters the battlefield, choose a color and you can add one mana of the chosen color. So essentially, it comes in tapped and it can tap for... You declare a color and can tap for that color of mana. Choose whatever color you want, but it can only tap for that um, going forward. And if you happen to have a dragon in hand or on the battlefield, it comes in untapped. Solid card. Absolutely zero things wrong with this. If you're playing a couple colors, if you get past this later on, no reason not to take it. I'll actually put this at like a 3 out of 5. It is very good mana fixing and limited. In standard, I don't know that you really need this. There's plenty of pathways and, um, geez, Fable Passage to get you the color that you need, or the colors that you need in, um, in the name thing. And there's even the dual colored snows, which are okay. They're not great, but they exist. Um, I don't know. In standard, I'd put this around like a 1.5-ish kind of thing. Of course, only in a dragon deck. You would never play this outside of a dragon deck unless you're just new to the game and conserving wild cards. And if you are, then by all means, go ahead, play it, you know, have fun, get into the game, decide if you like it, and if you do, then maybe this is going to be one of the first spots where you upgrade your deck. Alright, Treasure Vault! Oh god, this thing. So it's not insane, except it is insane, but it's not insane. Like, the first time you look at it, Treasure Vault, okay, Artifact Land. They're they're making Artifact Lands again, oh my god, it's insane! And then you can tap for Colorless, that's, okay, that's about on par. Uh, for X and X, you can tap this and sacrifice it, make X creature tokens. Make X treasure tokens, so you can pay two mana and make a treasure, you can pay four and make two treasures, you can pay six and make three treasures, and so on. How often do you want to sacrifice your land to make treasures that make land? It's also sacrificing an artifact to make more artifacts. There is some value to that. The fact that it comes in untapped is fantastic. Older formats are going to get a real kick out of this thing, particularly in modern because they just got some really good like affinity support in Modern Horizons 2, and this will fit into that deck quite nicely. Like honestly, you have some extra mana floating around. Sure, I'll crack this for like, um, you know four or five, maybe not four or five, I don't know, two or three treasure tokens. And now you have increased your count of artifacts and therefore all your affinity stuff costs a lot less and you actually get more value out of it that way. It's quite good. In standard, not quite as good. There is no affinity. There aren't as many benefits to having multiple things. This is a good treasure enabler, but the cost to generating the treasures is pretty hefty. Worth noting, you could do it at instant speed. So 
If your opponent has Field of Ruin because everyone's putting the friggin' Bulk of Exalted Deeds and Lightning Token on Faceless Haven, so they're all gonna run Field of Ruin for a while, and they try to kill this thing, you can in response sack it and make treasures. Uh, I do like that. But I don't know outside of a treasure deck, and treasure decks usually don't they want to be like kind of faster and get value that way. This is a very slow card. Mm. In limited, this is a 1.5 out of 5. You're probably going to want to play colored mana, you know, play colored lands. And the only good thing is that it can enable your treasure things. I'm slowing down, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it can also give you more artifacts if that matters. And mana fix you for like a turn or two. And hopefully that'll be enough to stabilize. In standard, I don't think this is really playable in standard, unfortunately. One out of five. Because there are a few cards that care about the artifacts, uh, the treasure tokens, in particular um, the Galazeth Prismari and the Goldspan Dragon. But beyond that, and I guess Magda cares about treasure as well. But I think Magda on her own is actually just much faster than this is going to make like five treasures to get a dragon. So yeah, one out of five in standard, 1.5 in limited. Be careful. In older formats, five out of five. Easy. Easy, I know, it's insane. Alright, and that's it! Oh my goodness, we did it, everybody. We got there. Uh, did I? I... No, we're good. Okay, I, for a second I thought I actually used the wrong background and actually made the wrong video. Whew, that would be a waste of one hour and change of my life. Okay. If you stuck through it for me, like, thank you very much if you made it through this whole thing. I know it's a lot of stuff, and feel free to... <laughs> Should probably have said this at the beginning of videos, but feel free to like have played these at 1.5, two times speed. I get it. Don't worry. It's all cool. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sticking with me. Hopefully you have some great games and you enjoy the set as much as I do. I'm really hyped for it. And stay tuned for the uh, intro video where I'll get more detail and kind of have some fun with it too. And hopefully it won't be as, as long as this is. But without further ado, without making this any longer, <laughs> good night or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. But as always, good luck.